67. You know, <clears throat> I, uh, I've been a Seventh-day Adventist now for some time now, but I haven't always been a Seventh-day Adventist. I actually was a part, uh, if you were here last weekend with Stephen, he just touched a little bit on the uh, Jesus Revolution. How many of you lived at that time during the 70s and 80s? And you've seen this movement mm -hmm. take place. Well, I was a byproduct of that, of that movement, and I came in 1979, 1980, when that movement uh, came into Canada. And um, I would just like to share a little bit on that, but that's not my main focus. My main focus is on what just happened in Asbury. Asbury, Kentucky, that was a few hours from where I used to live about a year ago. But this has been considered, an, uh, this Asbury situation has been considered a revival by men all around the world. And it's got much media attention. And before I go into that, I would like to just share that uh, when I became a, a Christian, I was 16, 17 years old, and I came into a church uh, that was a very Pentecostal, charismatic uh, church, and we spoke in tongues, we cast out devils, we were slain in the spirit where we fell on the floor, and yes, we even jumped pews. This was considered the moving of the Holy Spirit, okay? And um, so this, and I was a big part of this, and I can say that I really believe that the Lord uh, came into my heart at that time. But to say that this movement was the movement of the Holy Spirit, uh, I've got my doubts and I'll, I'll tell you why. And then I'll share a little bit about Asbury as well. Back then it was uh, common for us to say that we live by the Spirit. The letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. After some time, after becoming a Christian, the Holy Spirit started impressing me to read the Bible. And I started arguing with the Lord, saying, Lord, I don't need the Word of God. I've got the Spirit. You know, I, that's all I need. You know, all my problems in life are over. You know, and I, some of you know I came off of a lot of addictions. So I came into this movement. But eventually, the Lord showed me that I needed His Word so I wouldn't be deceived. And uh, the long and short was that uh, after much study, heartache, trials, I eventually became a Seventh-day Adventist after, after much study. But I want to give you seven reasons why I do not believe that uh, Asbury was a biblical revival. Now I put that word in there, biblical, because uh, many people call it a revival. I believe they were meetings. I believe that the Lord, uh, like he moved on me back in the 70s, I believe he moved on different people's hearts. But to call this a revival is not biblical. And the reason for that is because, well, the first thing, how, how do we tell if something is a revival, first of all? I want to ask you that. How can we tell? People who renew their vows to God. Okay, and... There's a change in, in your character. Okay, good. Good point. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, did you know that this went viral worldwide and there was over 100 million views on Instagram? <laughs> Legal was Instagram. Many traveled from other countries to be a part of this uh, movement. It was turned to revival and many experienced what they believed the moving of the Holy Spirit. Um, now, the Bible tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. So we want to make sure that if we're going to say something's not of the Spirit or not necessarily a revival, we've got to make sure by the Word of God. We can't just give our opinions, can we? So we need to make sure that, uh, that we do what 1 John verse 4 says. And what does it say? It says to test the spirits. For not every spirit that goes into the world is of God. So how do we test the spirits? Through the Word of God. So one of the first things I want to uh, discuss is, number one, it didn't, 
call people to repentance. Okay, that's the first thing. If we go to Acts chapter 2, was that a revival? It was a revival. It was a biblical revival, right? What did Peter do? What was the first thing that he did when people gathered there in uh, Jerusalem and they called uh, they called all the people together? He called them to repent, didn't he? And be baptized. Okay, That was the first thing. And there were signs and wonders also that followed him, okay? Along with turning away from what? Sin. From sin, right? Okay. And repentance. There was confession. And he was pointed in his testimony. You who betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you crucified him. So he was pointed. So there's a pointed testimony when it comes to a revival, first of all. Okay. There's no such thing as just a revival where there's all happy feelings and all that. Like what I experienced back in the 80s, 70s, and 80s. Billy Graham said this, that when revival comes, I expect to see two things which we have not seen yet. First, a new sense of the holiness of God on the part of Christians. And second, a new sense of the sinfulness of sin on the part of Christians. Okay, that's the first. And then Paul says in Romans 7 and verse 13 that sin becomes what? Exceeding sinful. In other words, you don't want to sin anymore. Now, I can tell you that my, con my conversion story was real because I would, when I was listening to the Holy Spirit, and actually after I was converted, I was walking down my sidewalk with a beer in my hand and drinking it, and, all, and the Holy Spirit just came and said, Tim, you're crucifying me every time you drink. You got a bottle of beer. I knew nothing about that. We didn't teach that in the church. So this, this movement, they were doing everything. And that wasn't talked about, you know, but the Holy Spirit was truly working on my heart. And so I listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit and, and I cried, I wept, and I gave these things up. So if there is a turning away from sin, then we know that that experience is true in an individual's life or in a, in a movement, okay? The next thing is Jesus and the disciples, they called people to turn from their sins, didn't they? Everywhere they went. There's revivals everywhere. Okay. The number two thing is, is that the fruit of revival will be a harvest of new souls being baptized. <laughs> Isn't that great? We see that in the Philippines, don't we? We see that in uh, uh, Brazil, um, Dominican. You know, I, I've been to different countries and you see the Holy Spirit being poured out in various parts of the world. And um, so that, that's a good sign when people are truly being brought uh, into the fold and being baptized. And what happened at Pentecost? Were many baptized? Thousands were baptized, right? Also there, after they traveled to proclaim the word and uh, the teachings of Christ, they, they commanded the people to be baptized and many uh, repented and uh, Repentance and confession of sins. All of these things took place. This didn't happen at Asbury that I could see. I'm not saying it didn't happen in individuals, but this wasn't preached from the front. Repentance wasn't preached from, from the pulpit. Okay? Number three, specific sins that are spoken against and forsaken. Was this ever taught in the Bible? Remember Sam Jones? Anybody remember the preacher Sam Jones here in America? A uh, long time ago, he was a powerful Methodist preacher. And in his revivals, he preached that alcohol, idleness, swearing, and drugs and other things were sinful. And people did away with them. Okay? And in Acts 19, verse 19, we also see a great revival in Ephesus. What happened in Ephesus? They burned their books, didn't they? They were, they were in witchcraft, they were into uh, sorcery, and they burned all their magical and witchcraft books. This equaled 50,000 pieces of silver. I figured it out, and it actually worked out to 200,000 days wages, or 550 accumulative years of wages. Now, how many of you, <laughs> is that a revival? <laughs> 
But what happened? This, there was a great revival, but they also gave up their sin. And this, to my knowledge, didn't happen at Asbury. I don't know of any bars closing up there, you know, or of anybody burning their sorcery books or giving up uh, sin. And, um, but in uh, Ephesus, there was a great persecution, if you remember that afterwards, because a lot of tradesmen lost their profession or lost their, lost their uh, business as a result of people turning from their sins and turning to God. So there's going to be, the devil's going to get upset. And what about Jesus uh, when he went to the, to the Samaria? He was uh, pretty specific when he said to the woman, uh, go call your husband. What did Jesus, and what did she say? I don't have a husband. That's right, the woman and the other seven aren't your husband. Whoa, <laughs> how did he know that? So he was very specific when, uh, when somebody came to him. And as a result of her confession, she went back and she called the people to come and see, and there was a great revival there, wasn't there? So, Billy Sunday, I'm sure many of you have heard of Billy Sunday, great American uh, preacher. After his preaching, bars would close, and marriages would be restored. That was a revival. He was a great preacher. I tell you, we need more preachers like him today. And the same with George Whitfield, and he's more of a modern day preacher. Anybody hear of him? <laughs> Not too many. George was a modern day preacher. You know what he did? He'd bring a 50 gallon drum with him, okay? Uh, that he put out for the young people to throw out all their, their no good video games, their pornography, and other sinful uh, stuff that they had. And they, they all threw it, they would all come forward, all the young, and they would throw all this stuff, all their idol worship and everything, into this bin and they would burn them. <laughs> that's a revival, you know? So that's, that's great. Um, when I was converted, I took all my music and pornography and, and, and I either burned it or I got rid of it. And the Lord, the Lord set me free from all those, from all those things. And alcohol, you know, I, I got rid of all that. I was a teenage alcoholic, if you will. I, you know, before I'd go to school, I'd have to drink, you know, or I'd have to get high or whatever just to go to school, you know. And, and the Lord convicted me of all these things. And I went back to school and, uh, they seen the change in me and asked what happened to me. Teachers, teachers did, and they, they acknowledged that something <coughs> did happen to me, that I did have a conversion <coughs> experience. Number four, unscriptural leadership and theology. <clears throat> this movement at Asbury was endorsed by unscriptural theologians. What I mean by unscriptural is that uh, you see these uh, musicians with tattoos and long hair play rock music, and uh, women pastors who spoke in tongues casting out of devils. They all endorsed this movement. And you look at um, the media, uh, Fox News and others, they were praising this movement. Now do you think that when the three angels message goes forward into all the world, that uh, the media is going to swallow it up and they're going to say how great this movement is? <coughs> Just read Revelation. You'll find out soon enough, Revelation 12, 17. And you'll see how the devil's going to react to that. Okay? So we need to be careful how we, how we view a movement, okay? Uh, you're not going to get a lot of positive uh, attention from the media or from those around you uh, when that happens. When I <clears throat> became a Christian, I had uh, my old friends and, uh, and buddies and family even rejected me or persecuted me, you know, for accepting the truth, but I didn't care because all I wanted to do was follow the Lord. Is that, our, is that what we want to do? Amen. Uh, number five, a true revival spreads. Okay. One location is not the is not the focus in a true revival. Okay. It spreads out. Uh, Charles Spurgeon. I know you've all heard of him. Heard of Charles Spurgeon. <laughs> he was an uh, he was an evangelist, and he said a revival begins by Christians getting right first, and then spilling over into the world. You don't keep a revival. You don't keep 
the Holy Spirit within yourself. You go and you spread the word uh, to everyone. After the facility at Asbury closed up due to zone regulations and population issues, the meetings seemed to quiet down after that, and you didn't hear much about it. So if you were truly energetic for the Lord, you'd want to share that. Don't you agree? <laughs> Acts 8, verse 4 and 5 uh, says that the disciples and the Christians, they went everywhere to preach the gospel. Number six. I watched the meeting and they, they, the main emphasis was on emotion and feeling. Okay. This was experienced more than faith and tangible transformation. The testimonies that I heard, a lot of people my age, or maybe older, they said, oh, they, they traveled from around the world and they said, oh, it was, I, I, I could just feel the presence of God and it's such a wonderful feeling. You have to be careful of feelings. Are feelings wrong? Could be. They could be, right? But uh, the, we, there you see great emotions with tears and everything, but uh, there's nothing wrong with feelings, you know, in and of themselves. Otherwise, we wouldn't have them. Otherwise, God wouldn't have given us uh, these emotions. But this should not be our central focus. You know? Focus should be power and transformation of character. Said no. <clears throat> where old things are forsaken and all things become what? New. Yeah. Um, again, in this movement, you've seen a lot of emotion, you've seen a lot of music, you've seen a lot of this going on, and not, you know, I'm not putting any of those things down in and of themselves. But if there's no repentance, if there's just that feeling, it just brought that brought back old memories. I see people I seen people doing this. Uh, watch this in my day, uh, younger years, and the same individuals would go out later and they would party. They were still on drugs. They were still homosexuals, uh, prostitution. All of these things still took place within the church, and whereas just hours before they were filled with the spirit. You know, so we've got to definitely be careful of that uh, this. This feeling, this movement, um, we need to test by the Word of God. Amen? Amen. You know, this movement is uh, unlike the powerful songs of the great, uh, of the Reformation. What are some songs that we think of um, from the Reformation? Mm -hmm. a, mighty, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never fail. <laughs> Just came <gasps> There's other songs that are great that really touch the heart, that really minister to the soul. Amen. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not this back and forth, this repetition, repetitious music that with uh, music. What would get the music going in our day was a lot of the music with drums. Drums specifically got the spirit to move upon us. Mm -hmm. So we need to be careful of these things. Okay, that's why we're even warned about uh, drums. You know, because it has an effect on that. Uh, on the emotional part of the brain. Number seven, last part. The absence of, of uh, Satan, resistance and persecution. So when a real revival is happening, there's often resistance and persecution again, like I mentioned. With Asbury, we see the media thrilled, like I mentioned. Uh, with everything that was going on, there was no opposition you didn't hear of any opposition or resistance. Uh, Fox News, I, you know, I like Fox News somewhat. You know, nobody's pure. <laughs> nobody's true on everything, but so we gotta be careful with everything. But, but uh, when the media uh, praises a reformation, we have to be very careful of that. And you know, red flags need to go up. Okay? In the Bible, we see these things. And again, Paul in Ephesus, the riot took place. And Paul was forced to leave the area for safety. And Jesus said that when you're persecuted in one city, do what? Go to the next one, right? So Satan gets furious, do you think, when he loses souls? Jesus said, you will be loved by all nations for my name's sake. No? <laughs> Somebody's listening. I just needed to see if someone was listening. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. 
Charles Spurgeon, who I mentioned earlier, his sons came home from a meeting, probably similar to Asbury, and they, uh, that they called a revival. So Spurgeon asked them, were there many conversions? And Spurgeon answered, or Spurgeon's sons answered, well, no. And were people angry? No, actually, they got along quite well, very much like Asbury. And he said, Spurgeon said, well, then it wasn't a revival. Because where God is moving, the devil gets upset and stirs things up. <laughs> he was right on, the, right on the mark with that one. So if you want to be part of a revival, kneel and pray. Confess your sins, repent. Give up those devices that are creating havoc in your life. Uh, when I became an Adventist, I went from emotion, living off of emotion, to strictly faith, because they didn't have that emotion in the Adventist church. <laughs> so imagine jumping the pews to coming into an Adventist church. <laughs> Hard to get an amen. <laughs> So, but, uh, so I went strictly from emotion to faith and I forsook my sins and many of my old friends and acquaintances, they, they wanted nothing more to do with me because they just couldn't accept, uh, accept the Sabbath and uh, many other truths that the Adventists teach. But I'm going to tell you something, nothing feels better than a life that's surrendered to God. Amen. Amen. And uh, in closing, I'm going to close with this story here. It happened uh, during the 1700s, and it was during a storm in the ocean. 26 Moravians were aboard a ship where they went as missionaries to Georgia, the USA. On the ship was a man named John Wesley. Anybody hear of John Wesley? During the storm, John was terrified. And he noticed, though, that these Moravians remained calm and peaceful. At the time, Wesley was a pious young minister of the Church of England, going as a missionary, or coming as a missionary, to America. He became curious to know what it was that the Moravians had that he didn't have. Later, when he was on land, the Moravian leader, Spankingberg, leader, asked John, Do you know Christ? And John answered, Well, I know he's the Savior of the world. But do you know he has saved you? Spangenberg asked. Well, Wesley thought about this, and over the course of three years, uh, in three years' time, he heard about justification by faith as written by Luther. Well, I heard what Luther wrote describing the change, which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warm. I felt that I could trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. Mm -hmm. And assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved from the law of sin and death. Wesley, from that moment on, after his conversion, spread this revival everywhere he went. And he went on to form a new movement today that is known as the Methodist movement. Mm -hmm. That peace can be ours today. Question, the big question is, is will we accept that peace and happiness in our own life? Thank you. Yeah.